Hello everyone and welcome tonight to the fourth and final talk in the um, 2020 Shaw Institute's Environmental Speaker Series, Planet in Crisis, Science and Survival. Could the COVID-19 pandemic help us meet the ultimate scientific challenge of the 21st century? Tonight's speaker, Professor Jeremy Jackson, acclaimed ecologist and paleobiologist will address this question in his talk, COVID-19 and the Environment. Professor Jackson holds emeritus positions at Scripps Institute of Oceanography and the Smithsonian Institution. He is currently research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. He's also author of over 160 scientific publications and 11 books, most recently, Breakpoint, Reckoning with the American, America's Environmental Crises and Shifting Baselines in Fisheries, Using the Past to Manage the Future. All of our webinars, four of them, can be accessed on our YouTube channel at shawinstitute.org. We invite you, the audience, to send questions in during the talk, and Professor Jackson will answer the questions at the end. And now my friend and colleague, Professor Jeremy Jackson. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is uh, not a topic I thought I'd be talking about um, a year ago. When I was spending most of my time uh, reflecting on a book I'd written called Breakpoint about the major challenges that um, we face in the environment in the United States. Um, but um, what we've just seen in, in the COVID-19 pandemic um, transcends all of those things and, and represents, I think one can easily say, the greatest challenge to human civilization that the world has experienced since at least the Second World War. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about three things. I'm going to first very briefly talk about the origin of the pandemic. And, and what's in particular very, very important about this is to understand that this uh, event, which has just happened, oh my goodness, this event, which has just happened, um, is, the, uh, is really not that exceptional except for the way it broke out. Uh, SARS and MERS didn't break out the way this has, and that we can expect these sorts of things to happen in the future. The second thing I'll then talk about are some of the environmental consequences of the pandemic that we've observed um, so far in a very short period of time. And then lastly, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about possible longer term prospects for greater sustainability, although these are still very, very iffy. So first, let's think about the origin of the pandemic. COVID-19 is a viral zoonotic disease that originated almost certainly from bats. Zoonotic diseases are illnesses that spread from animals to people such as plague, West Nile virus, and Lyme disease. In the case of Lyme disease, which is, of course, incredibly important here in Maine, humans get the disease through the bite of a tick which is infected by the disease bacterium, which the ticks get by feeding in turn on reservoir populations of infected rodents, mice and squirrels and the like, that are unaffected by the bacterium. So these, these rodents represent a reservoir, an infinite reservoir of the, of the pathogen, and control of the disease would either require the utter elimination of all the rodent population, which is clearly impossible or an effective vaccine. In contrast, the reservoir population for COVID-19 is still very inadequately defined, and it is still uh, unclear how and when it suddenly jumped to humans. Um, COVID-19 is the third severe coronavirus disease to emerge since 2002. The first was severe acute respiratory syndrome that originated in China in 2002. Then MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, originated in Saudi Arabia in 2012, 
probably associated with camels, and now COVID-19, which originated in China last year. And all three diseases emerged in relation to close contact between people and wild animals. Um, zoonotic diseases infect people from handling or eating wild animals or indirectly from livestock. And I just want to walk you through these pictures. The upper left is a rat market in the wet market in China, where a woman is butchering and preparing rats and where they're cooked and served. In the middle upper, you see a live snake, a live pangolin, and what looks to me like a bunch of sausage in an area which has also got about 20 or 30 different live species of animals. Uh, in the right, in the upper, is, is the animal that caused um, SARS in 2000, that transmitted SARS in 2002, the palm civet. Uh, in the middle picture, you have a frame where a man is sitting uh, next to the meat he sells, next to a cage with a live dog, and I can't tell whether it's a live or dead pangolin, and a couple of an other animals in the background. On the left is a bat farm for bat poop, uh, guano. Um, these sheds are all over in Vietnam, and that fuzzy stuff you see at top is where the bats sleep in the daytime and poop, and people gather it up. And, and, and of course, the guano uh, is full of, of virus from the bats. The lower uh, left is a, mat, a bat food market where bats are sold to eat, the lower right is the largest haul ever made of an illegal shipment of pangolin scales that was intercepted in Hong Kong. Each one of those gigantic barrels contains thousands of pangolin scales representing thousands of animals assassinated uh, for the purpose. And that charming little boy with his beautiful lamb uh, in the um, center bottom is, is living among live animals in the same kind of way, all of which have the potential to transmit the disease. So when we think about the origin of the virus outbreak, we've got the virus SARS-CoV-2, a primary host, bats. It might have been transmitted to people directly by eating bats, or it might have gone through one or many intermediate hosts, possibly pangolins, possibly palm civets, possibly who knows what, infects a human host, and then the human-to-human -human transmission occurs, which is the pandemic we're in. So it, we, it clearly is most similar to viruses in bats. There's great uncertainty, as I said before, about the possible intermediate hosts and why the outbreak occurred. This is especially mysterious because it's now evident that something like 3% of the population of China has been walking around carrying incredibly similar viruses to COVID-19 virus uh, for a number of years. And so why it suddenly became pathogenic, why it suddenly jumped is one of the many mysteries we don't have the answer to um, but um, there have been two such uh, outbreaks of a uh, zoonotic disease every year for a hundred years, and we can expect many, many, many more of these events to occur. So what have been some of the environmental consequences of the pandemic? I'm going to go through four of the simplest ones to talk about, keeping in mind that all of this is incredibly premature. So first, air pollution, how it's changed, then work habits and how changing work habits have environmental feedbacks, then the catastrophe of the pandemic on waste disposal and recycling, and then finally um, some aspects of the status of wildlife aside from the fact of the contact with wildlife as being a major driver of the thing in the first place. Um, I'd like to start uh, in thinking about this with this wonderful book by Alan Wiseman, The World Without Us. It was a thought experiment published in 2007. How long would it take the Earth to recover if all of humanity suddenly disappeared? And Alan attacked this question by going to places that so far have been least affected by humanity. And one of those was when he joined a cruise 
that a bunch of us at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography held in the Northern Line Islands in 2005, where we looked at a gradient of islands with abundant human population to know people and observe the striking differences in the reefs. But none of us then, or certainly not Alan, realized how fast things can change, um, at least temporarily, uh, and revert back to something approximating nature as we have witnessed in this global pandemic, and tragically how fastly, fast they can degrade again uh, when we get back to our normal ways. So this is an extraordinary picture published in Science Advances uh, this year. Um, January uh, 2020, incredible air pollution in terms of nitrous, uh, dioxide, nitrogen dioxide all around the industrial parts of northern China. This is mostly a transport automobile air pollutant. And one month later, it's gone, completely gone. And you can see this in reality. Um, in the upper left is the Forbidden City in Beijing uh, on a typical day. Uh, my wife and I went there on such a typical day and the air pollution index was above 300, meaning incredibly dangerous. And there it is, a month after the pandemic, extraordinarily clear, something that people haven't seen since the Olympics when the Chinese government shut down all industries so that the air would be breathable. And then in the lower panels, you see the India Gate in Delhi on a typical day. And then um, a month after the pandemic hit India, it is said that for all people under 50 living in Delhi, that the past few months have been the first time ever in their lives that they have been able to see the Himalayas clearly uh, without being blocked out by smog. And it's not just in the East. It's uh, when I left New York City um, to come to Maine in March, because I was scared to death, um, that is what the city looked like in um, early March. And by the time I left, two weeks later, it was already starting to look like the upper right. And the bottom panels are Paris on a typical day and Paris since the pandemic, really, really rather beautiful. The problem is, of course, that as people have gotten better, and the Chinese did a vastly better job than we have done in getting the virus under control, we're still floundering around, but they really, really did it. And so it all came back. The air pollution came back, the nitrogen dioxide came back, ozone came back, dangerous particulate matter came back, sulfur dioxide came back very, very quickly, uh, primarily due to industrial production. And similar rebounds are occurring elsewhere, although they're slower in the West. Um, one could say largely due to our incompetence in dealing with the virus, which is rather an amusing thing to think about, that we're less polluted because we just don't know how to uh, get a major health hazard under control, which I think is really rather funny. Uh, and it's gotten worse in the United States since uh, this graph was made with the big resurgence, but we'll get there someday, I suppose. Okay, and the most rapid resurgence in China has been done to power production and industry, the, the production of English, uh, of electricity. But what's really interesting to see is the contrast between residential use, which exploded during the lockdowns and has now decreased as the lockdowns are going away. Now, there's a very clear correlation between air pollution and mortality from COVID-19. Uh, this is an ongoing study by people at Harvard in the process of going through review. And what they did was they looked at the entire data set of chronic air pollution for the lower 48 states of the United States. And they looked at the map uh, county by county of, of chronic pollution, and then they looked at the death rate, and they showed that if you live in an area with high chronic pollution, you have a 15% greater chance of dying from COVID-19 than if you live in an area that doesn't have that chronic pollution. And 
the connection is very clear. Particulate air pollution is well known to worsen heart and lung risk factors for the virus. Uh, this is a major social justice issue because the worst air pollution is concentrated in the areas of the most disadvantaged people because advantaged people have deliberately put all the air pollution where poor people live, uh, people who don't have the ability and the power to fight it being installed where they live. So huge, huge social justice issue in relation to air pollution uh, in, in the United States and, and I guess to a lesser degree elsewhere. Okay, let's look at travel. Um, the pictures on the left are typical New York City weekday. Um, that's midtown Manhattan where the traffic moves about two miles every hour or so. And, and the waiting line to check in at an airport. And the upper right panel is Times Square, a couple of months after the pandemic hit. And the lower right is what, um, in my case, Delta Airlines Terminal looked like when I entered to fly out of New York City to Maine. And there were seven people in the entire terminal at LaGuardia Airport in addition to the 20 agents waiting for us to show up. Um, US passenger vehicle traffic declined uh, by about 40%, but it came right back. Uh, and in cities, it came right back because of people being afraid to take subways and buses, fear of public transportation, even though it's emerging actually that the risk of traveling on the subway, at least in New York City, is not particularly great at all. But travel industries are not recovering just as fast and airlines and everything to do with the airline industry has been severely affected. The plane makers, the aircraft suppliers, the airlines, the travel agents, the airports themselves, all of them have taken a nosedive. And it's particularly uh, affected uh, anything to do with the big jumbo jets and whatever. And the forecast is grim. Um, passage through TSA checkpoints in August was still down 80%. Many flights are canceled. Uh, most of the ones that fly are half empty. And the prognosis is really not very good for air travel. Um, so what are the big unknowns in all this? There, there are three that jump to mind. The first is working at home. How many employees are going to return to offices or continue to work part-time at home? The way I do, for example, here in Maine, just writing and editing journals. Uh, corporations are discovering huge cost savings on office space. And they've also discovered that their workers actually work really well when they're at home. And so there is a real trust between employer and employee in terms of uh, how, um, how work at home is work. But on the flip side, there's clearly lost opportunities for networking and creativity. The best projections now from all the business uh, work sites I've been able to find are for about a 25 to 35% work at home at multiple days per week for at least half of office workers, which of course would make a, a huge dent in commuting and, and transport generally for work. The second big thing is business travel. Will business travel recover to previous levels? Business travel has dropped to nearly zero. And business travel is 60% of what keeps the airlines afloat. All those people in the front seats, and I admit I used to be one of them because I flew so often. I've flown, I, this is a very embarrassing thing to say, but uh, for work, I've flown more than five and a half million miles on American Airlines, and so I buy the cheapest ticket, and they always stick me in first class or business class. So I'm one of those people you stare at hatefully when you walk by to go in the back. Um, but what you gotta understand is that your airfare to fly from New York to California wouldn't be $200, it would be $1,200 because you're traveling at that cheaper rate because of all those business people who, unlike me, are actually paying $5,000 for the ticket. Um, very few people expect that internal business travel will ever fully recover 
but travel to meet clients personally to schmooze with them and take them to Yankees games and stuff like that will obviously rebound. And then the third big unknown is who the hell wants to get in an airplane on a vacation when you could maybe get in a car and drive to the Grand Canyon. Uh, polls indicate that the majority of previous frequent vacationers say air, tra air travel is not worth the risk and they have no plan to do it anytime soon. And given that such a huge number of Americans don't believe in vaccines, a huge number of them aren't going to take the vaccine anyway. And so it's a big mystery, actually, what's going to happen to vacation travel in the foreseeable future. And cruise lines are apparently dead. They're canceling cruises as far ahead as 2022. And of course, we know that cruise ships were a petri dish for the, for the pandemic. So for all of these reasons, greenhouse gas emissions for travel are almost certainly going to decrease. But how much that will be and whether it's just a drop in the bucket compared to other kinds of pollution remains to be seen. Okay, recycling waste. This is, this is a really sort of sad story. And so I've got this wonderful picture of the three kinds of doing things, right? There's mixed recycling, which we've all been conned into believing is actually recycling. More on that in a minute. Then there's composting, which uh, is a great new thing in a lot of places, although, of course, it was shut down. And then there's landfill, which is where most of it goes and which is the, the fundamental problem. Now, you should all be aware that single sort recycling, that evil little blue box, is a scam. Um, throwing everything together damages the materials like paper and cardboard. Uh, people never bother to wash anything, so they throw their empty wine bottle and their milk carton with milk and with the paper and cardboard, which totally destroys its value. It requires expensive sorting. Scrap markets are in total chaos ever since China decided they were rich enough that they didn't want Western garbage anymore. And, and Western countries are, have, are in chaos because they haven't figured out what to do about it. And most plastics, no matter what they tell you with those nice little numbers, are really not recyclable. And pretending they are is just, is just fraud. In many parts of the country, whether you know it or not, all that recycling that maybe you even carefully watch the way I do, just gets burned for energy or gets stuck surreptitiously into landfills. And if you look at this picture, 40 years ago, none of those containers were made out of plastic. They were made out of metal, they were made out of glass, and they were made out of paper, all of which are easily recyclable, but um, they aren't anymore. And they are the plastic, the explosion in plastic pollution is, is one of the, the tragedies of the pandemic. And most of the waste disposal uh, and recycling problems relate to packaging. Think of all those Amazon boxes and the medical industry and, and, and medicine and industry. And, and face masks have become a major source of trash washing up on beaches. Composting programs have been cut for no apparent reason because people pick up the garbage anyway. Deposit stations have been closed just because people don't want to bother to run them because there's no health reason whatsoever that they couldn't be kept open. Uh, so recycling has really, really taken it. And then finally, I want to talk about some effects on wildlife. Um, there's the fun ones of the sudden appearance of wildlife. That's a coyote in Central Park. And the really depressing ones are the fact that in places like Africa, uh, now that the safaris for tourists have shut down um, and there aren't lots of people wandering around the Serengeti and South Africa anymore, poachers have moved in and there's been a slaughter of rhinoceroses and, and things like that. But I, I really do love the appearance of wildlife, so I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, these are mountain goats walking down a village street in Wales. Um, that's a raccoon uh, on, along one of my favorite walkways in southern Central Park. Uh, the lower right are monkeys on an interstate in Delhi. And the lower left is the clear water of the Venetian lagoons, which if you've ever been there, you know, 
are as black as the prow of that boat in the picture. And within a month, you can actually see to the bottom of the canals and see fish and, and all the rest of it, which is sort of fun. OK, so what are the implications of all this? Um, COVID-19, as I said before, is a mastic systemic shock to every aspect of civilization. Um, I would argue even more than World War II. I mean, people in the United States, uh, not in Britain, in Britain they had the blitz, but in the United States they worked hard, they made ships, they did everything, but um, they didn't worry about dying when they went home at night. And, 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 but everybody worries about dying when they go home at night, if they've got a brain in their head and, and are smart enough to wear a mask because the risks are there and they're there, they're there for everybody and they're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, you know, on the positive side, we've seen how much we affect um, the environment by the rapid clearing of the skies and waterways of, of pollution. Who would have thought that the air in a place like Beijing or Delhi could go from being genuinely incredibly dangerous to your health to perfectly healthy in just a month. And when I say dangerous to your health, the Chinese government freely admits and allows the publication on websites like the Nanjing Institute of the Environment, they admit that more than one million people die in China every year unnecessarily because of the industrial air pollution of the great path forward of the Chinese economy. And we can also see the pressure we have just in the emergence of urban wildlife. We've known for ages that coyotes roam the Hudson River and the East River along those little park areas, but to have them walk you know, across the streets into Central Park is, is sort of cool and a very new thing. But just as rapidly, of course, as the skies cleared, they became polluted again. And, 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 and so, so have we learned anything? Are we going to actually do something? Or are we going to just go back to business as usual, exactly the way it was before? Is there any silver lining in all of this for sustainability? And I would argue you have to look pretty hard. There have been huge setbacks, especially in the United States. Um, delay of all the meetings like the COP meetings for climate change control, biological diversity protection, the United Nations meeting on ocean policy, canceled, 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 which means another year for people to do all the horrible stuff they do uh, before people start talking about it again. Uh, in, in this country, um, the administration has taken the chaos of the pandemic to weaken climate and other environmental measures throughout the country. Uh, investments in new renewable energy and purchase of electric cars, like the purchase of everything, has gone down, even though it's a fact that um, low carbon generation continues to exceed coal. We're drowning in plastic, as I already talked about. And with the exception of COVID-19 research, which let me tell you, I edit a journal, I see hundreds of papers a month about it, um, scientific research has been uh, uh, halted in, in many, many ways. There are some potential advances. The European Union stimulus plan calls for a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, and it's not all hot air. Um, they actually are pretty serious about it. And whether or not they make it by 2050, there, there are measures within their stimulus that go in the right direction. Germany has very explicitly devoted a third of its monies for stimulus to increase public transportation, clean energy, electric vehicles, and that sort of thing, which is, is really good. And even in the United States, by some accident, that I do not understand, the Renewable Energy Production Tax Credit got extended in 2020. Miracles never cease. Um, advances in understanding the ecology and economics for pandemic prevention have increased dramatically. 
And there's also rising trust in scientists, uh, although that's been politicized. This is really interesting, and, and I, I've read something like 50, 60 articles, and I've only scratched the surface. The ecology and economics of pandemic prevention has become um, a really major, major field of endeavor. In terms of the tropics, clearing of tropical forests is clearly a major driver of novel viruses from wildlife emerging directly to humans or indirectly through chickens and pigs. Um, the transmission to humans depends on the intensity of the contact between uh, people and the natural environment. And, and as people invade forests for logging, for mining, uh, or just for settlement and farming, they come in contact in a very intense way with wildlife. And, 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 um, and this is clearly a catalyst of uh, zoonotic disease transmission. Demand for wildlife, especially in China, in urban markets, also increases transmission. And we've known about these risks forever. Um, but the COVID-19 pandemic has hopefully at least heightened public awareness and concern about the risk. Um, if you're not aware of it, there actually was a plan developed um, before um, the last election for uh, a great increase in monitoring uh, of the potential emergence of zoonotic diseases, but that program was defunded uh, by the new administration. Okay, the incidence of spillover from wildlife has also been uh, very clearly underreported. And I alluded to this before, but I, I really want to emphasize it. We have now learned that roughly 3% of the people in China were walking around with viruses very, very, very similar to the SARS COVID-19 virus, which started the pandemic. In other words, this pandemic was a time bomb waiting to happen. It wasn't because some dirty pangolin that happened to carry the virus uh, infected some person who ate it or whatever, and then all else uh, followed from it. This was something that was building for a long time. It's very complicated. It stems from the immensity of the complications of the interactions of people with wildlife. Uh, in China today, more than 300 species of wild animals are being brought together uh, in markets. And we know that um, there's a lot of jumping of pathogens from species to species. And we sort of suspect that in the process of this jumping around, that uh, this is conducive um, to the development of new forms. Um, that are will be particularly dangerous to people. Now, what's tragic about this pandemic is that the science and the protocols to monitor and detect new zoonotic diseases as they emerge is all there. We've known about it for a long time, and it's cheap. Uh, it's for about $30 billion a year, you could not only monitor um, very effectively and efficiently uh, in all the areas we'd be most concerned about. And I emphasize it's not just in nasty China. It's not just in the tropics. Um, MERS emerged in Saudi Arabia, which is decidedly not wet and tropical, and yet it was every bit as dangerous as SARS. Um, so those protocols are there. And in terms of the cost of pandemic, it's chump change, 30 billion bucks a year in comparison to the eight to $15 trillion projected global economic loss from COVID-19 um, is a very, very clear picture of what we should be doing. Um, but you don't hear a lot of discussion about it. And, and I think the people who do this sort of thing, their greatest fear is that there will be a vaccine and people say, oh, well, problem solved. Forgetting the fact that these things are emerging, dangerous new zoonotic diseases that are emerging at a rate of at least two of them per year. And there's going to be a next one and a next one and a next one and a next one. And it's not going to go away. 
Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is this, as a scientist, I think it's really delightful that there's supposedly increased respect for science and scientists. It's been really tough being a scientist lately uh, with alternative facts and also I read this article, this is, this is from research by the Pew Research Survey people, they're very highly respected. Um, so this is a data on the percentage of United States adults who have a great deal of confidence in scientists to act in the way that's in the best interest of them, to act in the way that's in the best interest of the general public. But then you look at it, and of course the red is Republican and the blue is Democrat. And what you see is that Democrats have actually really increased their faith in um, medical scientists because they're scared to death. And they've even increased their faith in lowly environmental scientists like me, but, um, but not, not the right. So, um, the, the, the pandemic has had, which is all about science, right? I mean, it's all about understanding data, has had absolutely no impact on one segment of the population. And American ignorance is, it's astounding. Um, these are data on the percentage of United States adults who believe that the incidence of the virus, the incidence of cases per 100,000 people is higher in the United States than elsewhere, similar in the United States than elsewhere, or lower than most other nations. And only half of all the people in the country know the basic fact that we've really screwed up, that we have, we have suffered extraordinarily more grief and economic loss than any other place in the world except maybe Brazil and who knows where, but certainly more than Europe, more than China, more than Taiwan, more than Singapore, more than Korea, more than Australia, more than New Zealand. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing. And then there's the political bias, and I, I'm not going to read through this. If, if you um, lean Republican, then only 30% of you know the, the, the basic data. And as far as I'm concerned, um, it's appalling that even among Democrats, only two thirds of people know the truth. And when I say the truth, okay, you can see the daily data every day on the Washington Post and the New York Times. So if you don't read those newspapers because you think they're left-wing rags, you can go to the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine website, which tracks the data from all the governments in the world of the number of cases and deaths in each of their countries and makes it freely available to the general public. And if you did that, you would see uh, what I'm talking about, that the incidence in this country is higher, has lasted longer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this has been very short because it's really all I know about it. But I just want to conclude with this basic point that the kind of ignorance that the last slide shows, uh, ignorance or willful denial, is the greatest challenge to the future sustainability of the planet and human well-being. We will not get out of this. We will not do better in the future until we come to understand that there is basic information, that it's highly pertinent to our safety and our security, and if we ignore it, we risk more pandemics, more death in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. That was fantastic. Um, we are now going to move on to the Q&A section of the talk. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question that was submitted. Um, and it goes as follows. Since COVID-19 exposes and exacerbates environmental justice issues, do you think that public discourse around the ecological crisis will shift towards dealing with social and environmental issues is necessarily related rather than as separate concerns? Oh, I think we're already moving in the direction of connecting environmental justice, uh, social justice and environmental justice. I like the term environmental justice. Um, 
it sort of highlights the fact that we're concerned about the environment and it highlights the fact that some people suffer more than others um, as horrific, as utterly horrific as the Black Lives Matter um, deaths from police violence have been, uh, one has to understand that the violence to disadvantaged people exceeds that a thousandfold. That um, if you look at, and, I, and I've been privileged to see some of these kinds of data, if, if you look at the um, life expectancy of people by neighborhoods, um, it's very, very dramatic. And, and, um, and this has been going on for a long time. And so I think, I mean, obviously this is a political issue and for some people it's just not making a dent. But for the people who are um, opening their minds to this incredible shock and who are also becoming more aware of the dire issue of global warming and climate change, I, I think that social justice issues are being carried into the conversation in a very constructive way. Uh, the problem, of course, is it's going to require leadership because we won't make the shift to incorporating justice into all of these issues until we have the kind of leadership that champions that. Thank you. Um, the second question is, do you recommend that social distancing and masking mandates become law, like seatbelts, for example? And is that the only way to, get, to begin to get control of infections like this? Well, I think when they're happening, you know, what's really interesting, I had the privilege of um, being an invited professor at the University of Hong Kong for a month, a year, for three years. And Asians are just really very straightforward about this. I mean, they, if they think that there's any risk, they just wear a mask. And it's not, you know, it doesn't decrease their masculinity or their beauty to do it. And, and, um, and we were going fine until this became polarized. I, I think there's no other way to, to say it. Um, if it requires making it a law, um, then so be it. There will still be... Um, there will still be people who won't do it. And, and so actually, really, I, it, 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 I, I think we have to somehow get there socially um, because there will always be, look at, look at the violence today. I mean, people are being attacked in supermarkets for asking people to put their mask on when they go in the supermarket. Um, security guards have been beaten uh, because they asked somebody to wear a mask. Um, are we going to have a thousand police at the entrance of every supermarket to make people do the right thing? I, I think we have to win this socially. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a third question. Um, it includes an acronym. So, will the thrive, and that stands for transform, heal, and renew by investing in a vibrant economy, legislation help us to move to a more sustainable COVID-19 pandemic society? Well, I wish I knew what Thrive was. Yeah. So I, I, I'm sort of at a loss to answer the question, but I, I, I do think that, stand back from it for a minute, the, and, and go back to that World Without Us book. You know, when that book came out, it was hailed as a thought experiment just to make the conversation go in the direction of trying to understand the impact of the way we live in the modern world. And now, if there was anything good that came out of the mass slaughter of this pandemic, it's the fact that people have seen dramatically the, the pressure that we put every day on the environment and unless they're willfully stupid, they have to understand that, um, well, the pollution death connection, for example. Um, and we have been moving sort of in the right direction. This is a very bad hurricane year. Every hurricane this year, like the terrible hurricanes of a few years ago, 
started out as piddling little storms and intensified horrifically in 24 hours when they hit abnormally warm water in the Gulf of Mexico. The last one that, that hit um, Western Louisiana is a case in point. It went from being a tropical storm to a category four in something like 24 hours because the water is too hot. Um, people are dying because of these hurricanes. People are losing their homes. People are, and, and um, you know, even in the shadow of um, Palm Beach, what, what, whatever that place is called, uh, Del Mar, uh, where Mr. Trump lives, um, people are having high tides drowning their front, drowning their front yards uh, every full moon, and they're starting to worry about it and, and, and starting to ask, and they can't get insurance. This is something that Steve Chappell and I wrote about a lot in our book Breakpoint, that um, you know, something like half of all the houses in Florida are at hurricane and flood risk, and people can't afford the $50,000 a year for insurance. So when their house gets destroyed, they'll lose everything. And they can't sell it, of course, because nobody wants to buy it. So these things are moving in a direction. And for people like me, you know, it's really important to remind ourselves that there's movement in the right direction because otherwise it can be sort of discouraging, especially now. Um, but um, yes, I think, I think we're, we're starting to see um, a movement in greater awareness along those lines. Thank you. There's one, just a quick question about the sort of the graphs that you show in your presentation. Um, I think people would like to know maybe the source for them or if they were available to... Um, Everything that I, you know, I rushed to do this. <laughs> Um, because uh, I had a lot of other things that, that were happening all of a sudden. But it's all public information, and I can actually get the sources and provide them so when I post this um, later on online. But um, it's really amazing. Um, just, um, you know, Google something like intermediate host COVID-19 and you'll get 10,000 hits. I mean, it's just remarkable. And, and so then I, I've gotten pretty good at learning how to filter through the garbage to find it. And you can also, anybody can go to Google Scholar. And Google Scholar will give you the scholarly articles, some of which might be a little bit more difficult to read than than. But for example, an incredibly good source is the Guardian newspaper from UK. They have hands down the best science reporting of any um, newspaper type publication. Uh, and, and, and the Brits are good at this, I mean, because The Economist is also very good. And I haven't seen it, but they're putting out a special issue on the pandemic. And I will read every word of that because it will be factual. The irony of all these things is that people in business who are looking for stability are as horrified by this as people like me, because this is a threat to economic well-being in the future, and it really needs to be understood that way. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Jackson. If there are any more questions, we can aim to answer them by email. Um, That's the and just a reminder to everyone listening that this video will be um, available on it YouTube and on our website in the coming week. So thank you again and thanks to everyone. You're very welcome and thank you people for listening.